and we just got to see what their lives had consisted of since they left Baghdad. It's an incredibly stark existence. So last night, if the concert went terribly, and you said, the, we're going to break up the band, I quit, yeah. you know, across the code is done. Yeah. What's your option? What would you do? I was, I was out of options for the band or like for my life. I mean, like my family down here calling me and like for the first time, my family is, was really interested about the band and us. Because my family knows as well as I know and all the guys down here know that we don't have a better option. When I, when I came here, I took all my, my savings I mean, I've been spending a lot of money just to make sure that this is my future, okay? And if this band's not gonna work, don't ask me about it. I don't know. Let's just say, in theory, that the band broke up. Would you go back to the war zone in Baghdad instead yep. of staying here? I was like, yeah, I'm going back to Baghdad in case this concert fell. I'll go back to Baghdad and face it. Probably like I'll gonna I'll die down there, but like who gives a fuck, man? I'm like after all, I'm like we refuse the idea about like from ashes to ashes and dust to dust. I'm like we want to be remembered. That's the thing. Just like Faraz, Faisal, and Marwan, about 3,000 Iraqis continue to flee their country every day. Technically, they're refugees. They're not refugees in the traditional sense of living in camps and being malnourished. It's a certain segment of Iraqi society that's getting out. It's mostly those with education and money, and it's caused a huge brain drain in Iraq. And once they get to places like Syria, they're not allowed to work legally. All this is creating what some organizations are calling the fastest growing humanitarian crisis in the world. What's life like as a heavy metal refugee? Oh, bad. You see this place that we're staying in, this is the place that we had our rehearse for the first concert in Syria. And, 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 and it's like three meters underground, man. I'm mean, like, the situation in Iraq is getting like bad to worse, like to horrible. And, 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 and like, we don't know. I mean, like my family calls me like every week or something and, and tell me like, don't get back to Iraq. Don't get back to Iraq. The situation is like horrible down here. And I'll be like, for how long? What I'm, what I'm still not happy about it. I'm, I mean, I left my family down there suffering still. I mean, they, they were supporting me from all sides. They've been telling me, just get out, leave your, uh, live your life, just go. I'm like, I had like, I worked like in a few jobs. I'm like, probably a couple or three jobs down here. And now I know how it is like to be a foreign and Iraqi person. Actually, not even like foreign. Right. I'm like, we're not even like in the level of the foreigns down here. We are like down the level of the foreigns. Because, you know, too many Iraqis down here, like, I guess like kind of like the Syrian people is kind of pissed off of having like more Iraqis because all that like, you know, affecting their economies and they don't have like a great economy down here. So I went down there and I worked in these like stores, like washing dishes and clean up floors, selling like stuff to people and knocking on other like strange people doors and, and, and like offer them stuff. And, and I was like, and they pay like real low and they're using you most of the time because they, they know that you don't have a better option. How much were you getting paid per hour? Fucking, that's like real shame on I mean, it. Like, a hundred dollar a month, man. And let's say we're talking about like 12 hours work in a day. Six like, days a week. Yeah, and you don't have, no, five, seven days a week. It's like, you're out of the death and destruction for the first time in years. Yeah. You have a wife and a kid that you brought from yeah. Baghdad as well. Yeah. What's the vibe now? Are you guys happy? Life is a, you know. It's safer Yeah. here, it's safer, but it's not a happy place. I mean, just like what they said, I mean, my friend says it before, it's, you have to start over again. You have to start building everything from nothing. And basically you got nothing, you below zero here. Because in Baghdad you had the zero, you had your friends, you had everything. But here you have nobody except you and your music. So you have to build it up again from nothing at all. I can't, because here, as, I mean, whatever I do, I don't feel like home, you know what I'm saying? We ended up spending about seven hours with them 
in this really, really cold room that had no windows. Uh, at the end of the night, they basically said, we're a band, and what we want more than anything in this world is for a record to come out. And they said, if you guys were serious in your offer to help us, what can we do? We said, look, go out there, find a studio, we'll record some demos, and we'll take it from there. So Marwan picked up the phone, started making calls and chasing leads, and finding out where you could record a heavy metal record in Damascus. معلم بدي اسالك شي سؤال في استوديو هيك شي يعني تسجيل اغاني حدا تعرفه يعني يسجل اغاني مليح فشي يكون مليح ان شاء الله هيك شي يعني وير از ذا هي سيز كول مي ان 11 كلوك اند اي ويل جيف يو نمبر فور ا جاي سو اف يو ار جوين تو ميك ذا فيرست البوم فور اكرس كولا On the night of Across Akauta's first concert in Damascus, we met a kid named Mike. What's up, man? <laughs> a 19-year-old Iraqi refugee who's Across Akauta's biggest fan. It turns out he's also learning how to play guitar, and Tony's his teacher. Tony, it's like a brother for me. Maybe I talk to them more than I talk to my brother, even. So they're good friends. They are cool. Tony is a phenomenal guitar player. At one point in his life, he wanted to become a civil engineer, but he gave it all up to pursue his dream of playing guitar. He's pretty shy, introverted, doesn't speak a lot of English. What would happen if somebody said to you, you can't play guitar anymore? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I can't stop. You can't stop. Tony was the first one to come to Damascus. He came a year before Faisal and Faraz, and unfortunately, his situation was far more complex than the other guys in the band. His dad's a drunk and his mom and his three younger sisters came over to Damascus from Baghdad and left his father behind. Now he had to take care of all of them, so he worked in restaurants and he started giving guitar lessons to help pay the bills. How many students do you have here? Uh, four. Four. As the band was looking around Damascus for studios to record their demos in, we enlisted Mike. We hired him as our buddy slash translator slash gopher. We hired him to take us around to different parts of Damascus to help us understand the Iraqi refugee situation a little bit better. So this is the, the bus station where all the, the cars come in from Iraq every day. These big gas-guzzling Suburbans barreling through the desert. And they go through Mosul and Fallujah, and it's apparently a real nightmare. The guys in Across the Kauda, they did this trip. And, um, they're not letting us shoot here. For some reason, we have to get permission from the Syrian government. So we're trying to bypass that right now. So how do you like it here? How long have you been here now? Seven months. Do you have family back in Iraq? Relatives in Iraq, yeah. Every Iraqi family in Iraq lost someone from their relatives or from their family. Bad things in Iraq, that's why we are here. Iraqi people don't deserve that, you know. All that happened. Bad. You believe in God? Sure, I believe in God, but I start like not to believe in God after what happened in Iraq. Because where is God? He must support us, right? What happened in Iraq? But I think that things will get better after years, after many Iraqi people die. So can you can you tell us where we are right now? This is the cemetery of strangers, people who die here in Syria. So they get buried here. What's interesting about this graveyard is that these are all graves of, of Iraqis who were pushed out of their country. And uh, the bus station is right over there. It's about a two minute walk away. So they get off their buses after getting exiled or running away for their lives and then they live out their last years in Syria and then die and, and get buried just a couple blocks from where they first came in. So we're on our way to the studio. We're trying to record a heavy metal album in Damascus. 